So I also want to start with a thank you to Fang for, for inviting me. It's been a, a really interesting symposium so far, and I look forward to more of the same. Um, in fact, I don't think I've ever been to one that had a title and a focus like this, so it's kind of a nice idea, I think, for a symposium. Um, so I'll be talking about the work of a single person in my lab, Jonathan Tang. He's a graduate student. He's fantastic. Um, he conceived of most of what I'm going to tell you about and carried out most of the experiments. And I think that most of you know that GFP is used uh, to mark cells or subcellular locations and that there are now quite a collection of GFP strains of mice from the GenSat project or other strains of animals. For example, zebrafish has quite a few GFP lines. And what one can use them for is, is a multitude of things where one uses microscopy to look at development or morphology or count the number of cells or even identify cells. And this has been an incredibly useful um, set of reagents for people across many fields. Um, and we've estimated that there's about 1,500 GFP lines now in mice, again, principally driven by the GenSat project, but there's also many individuals who have created GFP knock-ins or created transgenics using a cis regulatory region to drive GFP. Um, and one ends up with these beautiful collections of animals which have these great uh, marked cell types. And again, they've been incredibly useful, um, but we were a little frustrated because we were looking at all these beautiful patterns and actually, we wanted to do something with the cells that were GFP labeled, not just look at them. And um, Jonathan thought about this for quite a long time and tried to figure out whether he could actually use GFP then to study functions of GFP positive cells. So his question was, could one actually use GFP, the molecule GFP, to create biological activities or regulate biological activities only in GFP positive cells? So he started reading about GFP, and he realized that um, probably the reason it's been so uh, useful as a marker is that it is freely diffusible, uh, it goes throughout the cell, and it seems to have very little interaction with um, cellular proteins. It's generally considered innocuous. It's fairly small, fairly easy to manipulate. And that got him thinking about, could we use GFP again to uh, manipulate activities by endowing it with some specific activities, or by using it to generate activities? And in his reading, he came across uh, these very interesting antibodies uh, called camelid antibodies. And probably most of you know that a normal antibody has four chains, two heavy and two light. And the epitope binding domain is created by two chains coming together, the variable region of the heavy and the light chain. Well, camelids, which are yamas, alpacas, camels, and even some cartilaginous fish, like sharks, have evolved a way to make a two-chain antibody, which also has a very high affinity epitope binding region but very fortuitously, this region is made of only one chain, and it's a small domain. So these have been now exploited as high affinity binding reagents called nanobodies or chromobodies. And that was done, in fact, for GFP. So a group uh, at the university, or at the, uh, in, in Munich, uh, Rothbauer and Leonhardt, injected GFP into a camelid, and they raised high affinity GFP binding uh, domain antibodies of the type I just showed you, and then they isolated the cDNAs encoding the epitope binding region, that is the variable region of the heavy chain, and they showed, for example, in this crystal structure that the GBP, GFP binding protein 1 in this case, was binding to a particular domain of GFP. They actually isolated seven of these cDNAs, and again, they were all high affinity. They didn't map where the others bound, but one could imagine then, and Jonathan figured out, that one could take one of those cDNAs and then fuse it to other types of uh, functional domains to create a cDNA that has now a GFP binding portion and a functional domain. And one could then assay those to see if they could co-occupy GFP. So here's just the idea of the assay, is that one could then, by uh, making these fusions and assaying for co-occupancy, if one could discover that a pair of these GBPs could co-occupy, one could make fusions, so take the GBP, fuse to a particular functional domain, another GBP, fuse to a functional domain, and if they could co-occupy, one might be able to bring those two domains together then in an efficient manner using GFP uh, to create a novel activity. So these things would not come together, the hope was, at any high rate in the absence of GFP. So we tested that then by asking if we could uh, constitute a transcriptional regula regulation um, activity and the idea was to take two different GBPs that 
could co-occupy, fuse one to a transcription activation domain, fuse the other to a DNA binding domain, and for this test case, he used the uh, GAL4 DNA binding domain, which binds to UAS, and he used a VP16 activation domain. We also supplied to cells, as I'll show you, a UAS, so can bind the DVD, and a gene that was easy to assay. For most of the assays I'll show you, this is luciferase, but we can also use TD tomato for some of our readouts. And then put these elements into a cell and see if in the presence of GFP, they could come together and then turn on the gene of interest. So we'll be looking at assays where there's no GFP or it's missing one of these components, and assays where all of the components are present and looking at luciferase for the readout. So this was first done in tissue culture cells, the HEK cells. And this is um, the combination. So you can see here there's no GFP, here's there's no activation domain, here no DNA binding domain, and here's all of the components. And when all of the components are present, we have quite a bit of luciferase readout. But when any of them are absent, we lose it. And you can see it's quite a high induction rate. He also checked specificity. He made a mutation in the GBP1 binding, binding region and that also did not work. So it's very specific to the normal uh, GFP or some of its close derivatives. He looked at YFP and CFP, which are derived from GFP, and the system would also recognize those. It did not recognize the red fluorescent proteins, which it shouldn't. These are from a different organism. So then the fact that it worked led him to think about other ways one could use it in terms of having alternative DNA binding domains alternative activation domains, and also perhaps ways to control the timing of the onset. So the GFP basically gives the spatial uh, coordinates for the activation of a gene, um, but often the GFP comes on at times or places where you might not find it uh, convenient for your assay. You might want to turn on the GFP-dependent activity sometime after GFP comes on. So he then worked out a system, which I'll show you for drug inducibility, and I won't show you, but he's also changed these activation domains to get more or less activity. Um, so he used the TET system. So you, you, many of you probably know that there's a cis element that recognizes a TET activator or a TET repressor. And so by changing the DNA binding domain to recognize that TET element, he could then get uh, regulation by the addition of doxycycline. So doxycycline then will activate uh, this binding and this activity. And you can see here's a system with all the components without dox, or sorry, none of the components without dox, all the components um, without dox. And then when we add it, we can titrate up the, the readout of the activity. So this then gives one temporal control. Um, and then this was all done in tissue culture. We wanted to know if it worked in vivo. So um, the way that we test things in vivo is we use electroporation to deliver plasmids to the subretinal space of the, the, of the developing retina. You've already heard about the retina. I won't be showing you too much about it, but I'll show you a few sections of it. But there's an incredibly efficient electroporation uh, method that we can use where we can deliver at least five plasmids at once into the same cell. So to test this, that's what we did. We took a constitutive promoter driving GFP. Uh, the TD tomato now is the readout for the activity. Uh, the CAG uh, DNA binding domain or the CAG um, activation domain, these, this is a broadly active promoter driving the two components. And then this is an electroporation marker, lag Z. So if we co-electroporate these in vivo into the postnatal day zero mouse, we can get delivery into primarily progenitors. The plasmids are then passed off to the neurons that are generated by those progenitors. And then we can assay whether TDT comes on in a GFP-dependent manner um, a couple weeks later. And we're going to use this system to ask a que couple questions. First of all, is it dependent upon GFP in vivo? Uh, we're then going to ask whether we affect neuronal physiology with these components. We are worried because we're, we're putting in a fair amount of these activation domains. Uh, we also want to know if we could use GFP to turn on CRE and then delete um, an endogenous flux allele from the genome. And then also um, look at neuronal physiology uh, in GFP cells using optogenetics. So here's the experiment again. We take all of these plasmids, we put it into a postnatal day zero eye, and then we look a couple weeks later at sections. So uh, if we look at the electroporation control, here we have beta-gal readout. These are the cells that picked up the DNA here as well. Um, in this particular set of panels, GFP was delivered. So you see all the cells that turned on GFP. And now you can see we're also getting the TD tomato readout. In other words, this worked. We, we were able to turn on TD tomato 
in the GFP positive cells. If we left out the GFP, we got very little background, although Jonathan is a very honest person. He told me I should show this. Here's a little bit of background in this particular case. And if you're going to use this, your background probably does depend on what kind of level uh, you're driving these components at. This is actually a pretty high level, and we don't get much background. Um, again, we were wondering if we might be altering um, neurophysiology, so we turned to some collaborators at Harvard, uh, Bernardo Sabatini's lab, in particular, Genia Kozorowski. And Genia then electroporated these components into the lateral ventricle of an embryonic mouse and ended up with the components being expressed out here in, uh, in a cortical area in uh, S1. She then made slices, and she looked for green cells as well as yellow cells. You can see those sections here. So these are cells that are expressing GFP, and this cell is expressing TD tomato, so this um, means that this, this cell got all of these components. She then recorded from these cells, so she looked at non-electroporated cells, cells that just had GFP, cells that had all the components. She injected current, and she looked at then the train of action potentials, and that's plotted down here. She also looked at membrane resistance, and she also looked at capacitance. And they assure me that these are very sensitive measures of alterations in physiology, and it looks like we weren't perturbing in this particular configuration anything that she could measure. Uh, we then wanted to know if we could delete an endogenous floxed gene. So we delivered again in vivo with electroporation to the retina a GFP along with these components. And here we have Cre as the readout from the UAS. So we were hoping to have Cre activity only in the GFP positive cells. And in this case, we were using a floxed allele of a gene, OTX2, that we know is important in retinal development. So, so we knew what the readout should be in terms of cell biology. Uh, so here's just some panels from those sections from these mice. So these are some cells that got the GFP. This is an antibody stain for OTX2, the gene we were removing. And you can see we lost the immunohistochemical signal from the GFP positive cells. He then put in DS red, and for some reason he colored these green. It should be red, but at any rate, these are cells that got DS red. And we still have the uh, immunohistochemical signal for OTX2. And if we look at the readout in terms of the cellular uh, phenotype, these cells in the outer nuclear layer shouldn't be here in a normal mouse. So this is evidence then that we've lost the OTX2. This is the known phenotype. We can find PAC6 positive cells um, here in the outer nuclear layer when OTX2 is lost. So this then means that you should be able to delete uh, endogenous flocks alleles uh, from an animal. Uh, we also want to know if we could um, help physiologists um, do physiology from GFP positive cells. And we, as I mentioned, we're interested in the retina. These are the bipolar cells in the retina. And there are two subtypes of bipolar cells marked by a particular GFP line called Gustusen GFP, the type 7 cone bipolars and the rod bipolars. And here's a picture of, a, of, of these cells in the transgenic. So Jonathan electroporated in then the UAS TD tomato along with these other components. And the cells that got electroporated were indeed able to turn on TD tomato. And you can see there's very little background. Um, and, and to the best of our ability to assess this using morphology, these cells look perfectly normal. So then we wanted to know, could optogenetics be used to drive activity in these electroporated uh, Gustustin positive cells? And for that, we collaborated with Botan Roscoe's lab at the FMI in Basel. So the way that Botan's lab does experiments with the retina is they take the retina out, and normally they shine light on the photoreceptor layer, and they record from individual ganglion cells. If you look at a recording like that, so this bar indicates when light is present on the retina, and this is the uh, result of their recording. So in a normal configuration, in a normal retina, the light is driving responses out of these photoreceptor cells. But we wanted to know if we could drive responses out of these Gustusen GFP cells. So we wanted to block the normal uh, input from the photoreceptor cells, which can be done by including a blocker APB. And when one does that, one can quench uh, the responses from light emanating from the photoreceptor cells. So now, um, electroporating in the components along with the UAS driving channel rhodopsin fused to M. cherry, the expectation was that then these Gustusen positive GFP positive cells would be inducible with light to hopefully drive activity in some of these ganglion cells. And that's what they were able to show then. When they shine light in the presence of APB on this configuration, they could get responses in these ganglion cells. So this should enable people to take the collection of GenSat lines. There's quite a few of them that sh which mark subtypes, not only of bipolar cells, but also of amacrine cells and other cell types in the retina, and start to pick apart uh, the different types of, of activities.
Oh, I should also mention they were able to fill the ganglion cells after the recording so they could then start to look at where the dendrites um, are and other aspects of the ganglion cell morphology. Jonathan also checked to see if this would work in other species, again, where there are transgenic GFP lines, and we collaborated with Matt Harris's lab at Children's Hospital, and they had a uh, GFP line of, of zebrafish, you can see here, and in this case, Jonathan injected the components into the newly fertilized egg, and he was able to see the TD tomato readout in the GFP uh, strain, but not in a strain that doesn't have GFP. And we have also a no-injection control here to look at, again, activity or development um, to make sure that we weren't creating some kind of aberrant development. So it looks like this can work beyond just mice and hopefully in other species where there are transgenic GFPs. Um, so from this point, I'll just summarize what we've done with what we call our T-Dogs, transcriptional devices dependent on GFP. I've shown you that you can drive gene expression using different activation domains and binding sites, and again, that's in a GFP-dependent manner. One can regulate the timing by using doxycycline. There's probably other types of regulation that one can envision. Uh, one can use this then to basically turn a GFP cell into a Cree cell and delete or activate whatever one wants to do, uh, turn on or turn off genes uh, through Cree-mediated exc excision. And one can also do physiology using optogenetics. And it works across species. So we wanted to know if this was more generalizable. So what, we've, what I've shown you here is all transcription-dependent um, activity. Uh, we wanted to know if we could also bring together other protein domains to create other types of activities dependent on GFP. And because, again, Cree is very useful, we thought we would uh, explore whether GFP itself could be brought together. So the configuration I just showed you is driving Cree with a UAS, so this is a transcription configuration. It requires three components, this fusion protein, this fusion protein, and a UAS Cree. So we wanted to know if we could simplify it a bit and also just see if it was a little more generalizable by taking Cree itself, splitting it into two, an amino and a C-terminal half, fusing again to these GBPs, and then reconstituting a CRE activity in the presence of GFP. And you can imagine doing this, for example, with proteases or signal transduction components, something that you might want to turn on only in GFP-dependent cells or, or positive cells. So again, we used this assay where we're looking at a luciferase readout. In this case, what is going on is that CRE is required to remove a stop cassette so that luciferase can turn on. And again, we do this first in tissue culture. So this is the activity in the presence of all of the components, and this is in the absence of various components. It doesn't induce at quite as high a level as the transcriptional uh, system, but it still gives a very nice boost. It again is dependent upon GFP and the GFP derivatives. It doesn't react with the, uh, or doesn't, it's not a, um, enabled by the red proteins. And again, we went in vivo using electroporation, so again, this, this uh, mix of plasmids, but this time we have a floxed DS red as our readout, and we're electroporating, and then we're looking. Here we're introducing GFP with a constitutive promoter, so all of the electroporated cells, which are shown here in green, you can see almost all of them are turning on the DS red. Uh, if we use instead a uh, rod specific promoter to drive GFP, Rodopsin uh, GFP construct, where we get um, nice expression of GFP only in rods, again, we get this nice specific. Uh, kind of activation. There are cells that are electroporated here. You don't see any uh, turning on of the construct. And if we leave out GFP again, we have a very nice specificity. Here's the electroporation control. We had good electroporation, but we're not getting much background. And again, I, I think background will depend for different people perhaps on their system, but we've been really happy with the level that we see here. So now, um, if you're thinking of using these, um, you might be thinking about, well, how would you use them? Not everybody is fortunate enough to be able to electroporate so many plasmids into the cell type of interest. And electroporation in general doesn't give you a fully transduced tissue. So if you want to use this to either get a more full kind of coverage of your GFP cells, or you can't do electroporation, there are other uh, ways to do that. Many neuroscientists use AAV to deliver their components of interest. Uh, one can obviously make transgenics and then cross a GFP strain to a transgenic that expresses these uh, T-dogs or Cree-dogs, and then include a UAS, either again from an AAV or electroporation or another transgenic construct. So one can have sort of a mix and match of transgenics with electroporation, AAVs, et cetera, depending again on, the, on your needs. 
Um, in fish, they can actually deliver these components um, using microinjection. So we've started to work then on AAV delivery uh, for these components. Um, and I'll show you some data from our first set of AAV experiments. So we made an AAV that has a, generic, a fairly generic promoter that's pretty useful in the nervous system to drive either GFP, hopefully to activate, or a, another green fluorescent protein from a different species which is not, should not be reactive and is not reactive with the components. So that's a control. Uh, we then have AAVs with either the N-terminal half of Cree or the C-terminal half of Cree, so this is a Cree dog configuration. And then we have another AAV that has a Flox TD tomato. So if a cell is co-infected with all of these things, then they should become red. So they should be green and become red. If ZS green is included, they should be green but not red, if it's specific. So again, we do this in vivo um, in the retina. Um, this is now a cross-section through the horizontal cell layer, which is the layer just below the photoreceptors. And you can see that we have GFP uh, very nicely expressed here if we have an AAV GFP or ZS green, uh, if we deliver ZS green. And we have a very nice readout of the tomato um, when we have GFP, but not when we have the ZS green. So now one can then turn on basically any gene one puts into an AAV um, using the GFP. Again, maybe the GFP is from a transgenic, maybe the GFP is from an AAV with a specific promoter or some other kind of configuration. But you can then get the um, uh, the TD tomato to come on in vivo. This was pretty efficient in this case. I should say that AAV seems to love horizontal cells, so it's pretty easy to get a high co-infection rate there. Um, so then we wanted to know if we could use some transgenic GFP uh, lines that um, one might want to study the function of. So again, we took these AAVs that have, one of them has the N-terminal, one has the C-terminal. The GFP is now coming from a transgenic, and we were looking for a readout of TD tomato only in the GFP positive cells. So this is a, uh, a subset of ganglion cells. You're looking at the inside surface of the retina. This is a transgenic line where only a subset, there's lots and lots of ganglion cells here, just a subset is being marked in this particular GFP strain. We infected with those components and we look for the TD tomato readout and you can see that we're getting nice TD tomato readout. These are blood vessels which cause us some background with this channel. Um, and if you look to see if those are GFP specific, almost all of them are. So here's just a few of them. You can see that they're co-localized then with the GFP. So if one can then access um, subsets of cells in the nervous system with these AAVs, what can one do with that? So one of the things that we're interested in and our field is interested in is some of the circuits that are in the retina. You've heard a little bit about that already. This is the lineup of ganglion cells. This is uh, amacrine cells. These are bipolar cells. I already mentioned those. These are the horizontals. These are the photoreceptors. And we really don't know the circuits among all these different cell types, but we know that different ganglion cells are connected to different kinds of amacrine cells or bipolars. So it would be nice to start to look at individual subsets of ganglion cells and ask, for example, if this ganglion cell is GFP+, plus, who um, are its synaptic partners among the amacrines or the bipolars? So we can now use the components to do that. We can combine this with some viral tracing. So our lab's been developing VSV, and other labs are using rabies virus or pseudo-rabies virus to, as transsynaptic tracers to look at synaptically connected cells. So here's just a cartoon explaining how one could combine these methods. So here's a cross-sectional sort of cartoon, very simplified of the retina. Again, there's many kinds of amacrines and ganglions. But if you have a subset of GFP-positive ganglion cells, you can start to ask, again, about their upstream partners. And one can do that by combining the GFP components, these, these T-dog or Cree dogs, with viral tracing. So some of you are very familiar with this. This is how it's been used for monosynaptic tracing with rabies. I'll just describe, I'll walk you through it if you're not familiar with it. So if you had a GFP subset of ganglion cells, one could use the T-dogs or Cree dogs to have those cells and only those cells express a viral receptor called TVA. And again, one can do that by AAV infection with the T-dogs, with an AAV that has a UAS driving TVA. So if one co-injects these things, only the GFP cells should uh, express the receptor. One could also inject, for example, the AAVs with T-dogs and use a floxed strain of mice. We made a flox TVA strain. It's available at Jackson Labs. So one can, again, have just, just the GFP cells expressing TVA. One can then introduce a viral construct, and this can be done by intravitreal injection, for example. And if that virus is equipped with an MVA glycoprotein, it can only infect the TVA cells. 
So by adjusting the dose of the virus, or in, at this step, the dose of the AAVs, one can again get a random sampling of the GFP cells infected then with that virus. Now, if one also includes um, a, uh, so if one infects, sorry, let's say that virus has a, a cherry reporter, one will now have the TVA cells or some subset of those TVA cells expressing the virus. And if one wants to then look at the um, upstream connections, that is the amacrine cells, one can also include a viral G protein, which enables retrograde transmission of that virus. And let's say that virus is crippled such that it can only spread from a cell in which you supply that viral G protein. That means you can then start to look at the partners because the virus will only be able to transmit from those cells that get the T dog components, the UAS, G, et cetera. So one can target these cells using the TVA, and then one can direct the virus retrograde by virtue of also delivering the G protein in a GFP dependent manner. One can change the G protein so that the virus can also go anterograde, and there's at least a dozen uh, retinal recipient areas um, in the brain, so one can start to look upstream and downstream from a GFP set of neurons using these components. So just get a little bit of summary here then. Um, if you have GFP lines that you're interested in using, you can deliver components either by electroporation, microinjection, viral delivery. You can mate also to transgenic mice. We have, um, we're in the process of making transgenics where the Cree components, the amino and C-terminal Cree dog components are being um, knocked into a constitutively expressed locus. We're also going to make some UAS versions. We're also going to make some of the T-dog ones, but hopefully the first ones to come out will be the Cree, because many people are interested in Cree. And I should mention that some neuroscientists um, want more specificity than one can get with just a single line of transgenics. Susan Demecki's lab has developed a very nice intersectional uh, method where they have a readout. In her case, they've been using, for example, the DREAD receptors. And the DREAD receptors are equipped with both FRT and um, LOXP sites so that the only cells that will turn on the DREAD receptor are those that get Cree and FLIP. And by mating mice that have different expression patterns for Cree and FLIP, one gets an intersection. And that intersection then are the cells that turn on the DREAD. Well, there's not that many flip lines. Many of you probably know there's very few flip lines, although there's a lot of GFP lines, and there are fewer, but still quite a few Cree lines. So one could take a GFP line and use a UAS flip. So essentially create flip lines out of GFP lines and mate them to Cree lines, and then have the intersection between GFP and Cree give the intersection for alleles which are both Cree and flip dependent. So I think that will also be a very nice use of this and again expand sort of the use of all of the GFP and Cree lines that exist right now. Uh, just, so just to summarize, um, I've shown you that you can use GFP to create gain and loss of function scenarios. Um, one can go beyond even just Cree recombinase um, in terms of, sorry, uh, Cree recombination of a floxed allele that's in the genome. One can also deliver, for example, hairpins that are floxed. Uh, you can also do some circuitry mapping. I hope that this will be useful to people who are using rabies or VSV or pseudo-rabies virus in combination then with, with GFP transgenics. Optogenetics is a possibility, and as I mentioned, one can use the uh, GFP to create a flip to then lead to the intersectional possibilities. And I think this is more, perhaps could be more broad um, in terms of concept or application that one can think about using even non-model organisms where one doesn't have GFP, but if one uh, wants to make these camelid antibodies for an intracellular antigen, and I'll just throw out a possibility, some intracellular antigen like a GAD protein perhaps that might be specific to a subset of cells that you want to study, um, then you can use again this whole approach of getting the binding proteins that are high affinity, uh, then making the fusion proteins, et cetera, to then target specific cell types in animals that we don't have transgenics for. Uh, so that's possible. Um, and really, you can think about other types of molecular switches. There's a lot of clever biologists out there, and I'm sure that you can think of other ways that one can use GFP or another protein to scaffold together two or three activities um, and to create, again, novel activities. There's quite a few um, you know, animals in which you can at least introduce components, even if you can't do it in the, the really broad way that's been done for the mouse or the zebrafish, but at least one has the possibility to introduce components. And just to, again, acknowledge the people who have done this, we were uh, very fortunate that Leonhard and Rothbauer uh, gave us those GBPs at the start of our studies. Uh, the cortical slice physiology was done in Bernardo Sabatini's lab. 
We had great collaborators in Botan Roska's lab to do the retinal physiology, and the zebrafish work was done with Matt Harris's lab. So I'll stop there and be glad to take questions. So you mean in a, in a GFP transgenic where we don't actually see the GFP, do we get reporter activity? Yes, we have seen that. In fact, this com these components are a little more sensitive than GFP itself. Um, so we know it's not background because we don't see it in GFP negative strains. So if you have a strain where, you know, maybe with antibody and really pushing it, you see a little GFP, you will probably see these readouts in those cells. Now I can say that you can dumb it down if you want by delivering less of the components. Yes, we've been thinking about that and using an MS2 or something to then create. Um, I think that's a reasonable possibility. And that would be very nice in terms of, again, picking up cell type specificity and, and really being able to do, I think, some combinatorial things. So I just follow up with uh, um, a glorious question. I think sometimes it's possible when the GFP is like a broken down, so the antibody still can recognize the fragments, but we don't see a fluorescent protein. That might, that might explain your background issues. Yeah, so again, I wanna say it's not background <laughs> because we don't see in GFP negative cells, but yes, I think the sensitivity of different assays are different. And I think that one just has to you know, think about how one is assaying things to know what you're really looking at. So, um, I'm here. So uh, I have like a flip side of the question. How's the penetrance? Like, is like every GFP positive cells that would be accounted for the um, CRE expression or um, the subsequent? Um, yeah, so I think it again depends on the delivery method. So um, we can get over 90% with the electroporation. Um, of cells that we calculate get all the components. So when we electroporate, we don't get every single cell getting all five components but we can actually make a correction for that. And of all the cells that get all five components, it's over 90% show us the readout. But I think, again, this is really gonna depend on how you deliver the components and the expression level of the components. Uh, we haven't been able to look at it in transgenic configuration. That'll be interesting to see um, when we know every cell has the components. That will be a nice way to look and also to see maybe GFP dosage uh, dependence. I didn't, I took that slide out, but there, I should say about GFP dosage dependence, it's interesting. There's really high levels of GFP, you start to lose the reporter, which is actually predicted based on the way it works because you can titrate out. So each GVP has its own GFP. So one GFP doesn't bring together two components. If there's a lot of GFP, we sort of saturate all the GVP. So really high levels, you start to lose it. But in a practical sense, we actually haven't lost, there's very few strains uh, or situations where I think that will pertain. And it is interesting also on the low end, it's actually quite sensitive. Uh, again, cells that don't appear GFP positive can still have the readout. Yeah. So that, now I've asked my real question. Okay. So um, in a way, I actually, I was thinking about your, uh, at the end of your talk, you're talking about using some endogenous component to, uh, to use this technology. In some way, I actually think it's better to use exogenous components because um, the, if you use the, endogenous component, you might titrate out yeah. the component. Also, you might sort of move. You might hurt the cell, too. Yeah. yeah you might move the extra cell, like a cytoplasmic protein into the nucleus. Almost probably you want to use Yeah, the I think the idea of using an endogenous would have to be, you have to be really careful considering what you want to use because I think it, and this also is pertinent for the question about RNA. I think that if you are gonna bind up a cellular component that might be useful to the cell, that you don't wanna probably bind it all of it up, and you probably don't wanna drag it into different compartments either. So I think the idea would be something that's expressed at a fairly high level, and then not expressing a really high level of the component. So again, you're not saturating out all of that cellular component. I think we'll just have to, it's probably gonna be idiosyncratic, you know, case by case. But I think for people who don't have any other options in non-model organisms, it might be something that they would wanna consider. Mm 